Hi, welcome back to the channel, Michelle, and today I'm participating in another collab video. Now this collab video series comes from the perspective of parents who prefer secular homeschooling, so home, secular homeschooling resources, books, all that stuff. So I'll make sure to leave the playlist down below so you can follow along and see what everybody else is going to talk about. So this, this topic is exciting. So the topic for this video is books every homeschool family should read. So I've divided mine into different sections. So if you're new here, I'm homeschooling my two older kids. I have a 10 year old who's in fourth grade. I have a six year old in first grade and I have a three year old son homeschooling my two oldest, like I said, and this is our second year of homeschooling. So how I divided this into, because it was so hard to <laughs> narrow down the book choices, is resources for adults or educators will be my first section. Next will be some readers or resources that have worked really well for my fourth grader or my older daughter. And then the last one will just be some of my six-year-old's favorite, favorite books that she's recently discovered. So it'll give you different age categories to work from. But I will start with the oldest section. And this section is resources for adults or parents to help learn more information or to be able to translate some of the information learned to your children. So I'm going to flip the camera around and give you a closer look at some of these books and then tell you what I like about them and briefly what give you a description of that book. So the first book up is Mathematical Mindsense. I have an entire video on this specific book that I will link up above. But this is probably one of the books that really changed how I homeschool and how I approach um, a lot of parenting as well. So this book goes into, here's the introduction, it goes into how your brain learns and specifically mathematics, the power of struggling and making mistakes, not only in math, but in life as well. And it does have a lot of scientific research in here and suggestions on how you can implement things. But I really enjoy how it talks about how your brain works and how your brain physically grows from making mistakes. So it's very focuses on a growth mindset. So this really, especially with people who struggle with math, that's pretty common that we did this um, in our homeschool too, where we crinkled the paper and all the mistakes you made, where is your brain growing? But people have a tendency to struggle in math and there's this idea that you're either good or bad at something and math is so much more intricate than that. And it goes into details about math, how you can see mathematics in everyday life and the complexity, complexity of that. But it really helped my oldest with her math anxiety and both it helped me as well, just being able to teach math as someone who came from a background of, I would say math anxiety and avoidance almost, to being able to teach it confidently and knowing I don't have to have all the answers or be really strong in the field, but having willingness and openness to learn alongside my daughter. So this book has really helped both of us deal with some of our, like I said, math, math anxiety and approaching things from not getting it right or wrong, but as an opportunity to learn. So I highly re recommend this book. Next is a series, series of, I would say, probably parenting books. So they're written by the same author, and that's just to cover up the library information. So how to raise an anti-racist and how to be an anti-racist. So these, I think, are very helpful, not in only educating, but as a parenting resource as well. This is aimed more towards, you know, adults, how to deal with racism as an adult, and then how to implement anti-racist thinking in your children. And what I like about, because it's by the same author, what I like about both versions is that it really talks about how to approach anti-racism and teaching about social justice issues and why it's important. And one of the big things is parents have a tendency to bubble their kids because they don't want to expose them to harder things or difficult things or things that make them sad, or they only want to provide a certain bubble to remain that innocence. But really how introducing concepts like racism 
at how to be an anti-racist is essential, especially at a young age, and how it can be done in an age-appropriate way. So the author talks about, so in this one, let's go over how to raise an anti-racist first. It talks about the author and it goes through the author's personal experience as becoming a parent all the way from birth. So as you can see, birth all the way into kindergarten and preteen, middle school, high school. And he does it in a way that he talks about scientific information, but also his personal narrative as a parent. And I think that's really helpful, not just to get the scientific information, but a parent's perspective as well, and why talking about these things are really important. So it does go through, like I said, the early years all the way into high school years. And when you're getting into high school years, it's more his perspective because his child wasn't um, old enough for that part. But this is definitely aimed more towards adults and he, the author is able to take things like ethics, history, law, and science and be able to weld them all together to really give you an understanding of this. So again, here's the table of contents. It goes into many different things, as you can see, body, culture, behavior. So each chapter kind of gives you a definition, what is a racist, what is an anti-racist, and then some, um, like much like the other one, like a personal narrative, but with all those different areas like ethics, history, law, and science weaved in to give you a better understanding of it. So the next one would be all these. So it starts, each chapter starts with a definition and a, then it gives you information and a personal narrative to go with it. So I, again, I think these are really good resources to educate yourself and really approach those areas that I think a lot of parents are uncomfortable approaching. So those are ones I suggest and to go with that as well. I've talked about this book as well. I have a um, review I'll link up above too where I talk about how and why I teach social justice in my uh, homeschool and why I think it's important for children to know. So this is, I talk about this book. I think this is an awesome resource, how to raise compassionate, anti-racist, just-minded kids in an unjust world. Because here's the thing about bubbling your kids. You can bubble them all you want. That's not going to change how the world is. What's going to change how the world works and functions is by raising children to see these or acknowledge the wrongs or failures within our own systems so they can change them and make it a better place and world for everybody. So you can see here, uh, what is social justice parenting, the need to belong, raising children. And again, this author goes into her narrative as well with her children raising her sons and why social justice parenting is important. And one of the things, and she talks about in here, are you parenting from a place of fear or radical love? When you say you're an ally or an activist, but you still want to keep your children in a protected fear-based bubble, then you need to question what that means for you and your family. It is my responsibility as a parent to make sure my children are aware of what's going on in the world and that it's our responsibility as a family, as human beings, to educate ourselves on how issues out there impact others. The only way we can contribute to a world that's more peaceful, loving, and inclusive is to do work that highlights and exposes where we fit into it, our privileges and our pain points, and consider how we can be of service to others. If we only discuss events and topics from our privileged existence, we're not allowing our children to grow in ways that embrace other perspectives and seek to solve problems. For society's awareness, consciousness to transform, we need everyone, parents of color, white parents, wealthy parents, those living in economic poverty, ethically diverse parents, parents of children with disabilities, to be willing to raise our little ones to see the value and humanity in all of us. So I think that really sums up this book perfectly. And one of the things I really appreciated about this book is she talks about one of the first steps to teaching about social justice is really honing in on your own personal biases. And there's journaling, writing activities within the book and questions to ask yourself that really bring out as an adult, especially some of the things that you were taught as a child, things you were exposed to, and how those molded your viewpoints so this would be an example of that. I found that really helpful to really do that self-reflective work 
to understand how I was raised and how that affected how I teach my children and why it's important to talk about these issues. So this is definitely a book I would highly recommend and explore, at exploring those different ideas and why it's important. All right, so the next one, the last parenting homeschooling book I would recommend is Why Don't Students Like School? Cognitive Scientist Answers Questions About How the Mind Works and What It Means for the Classroom. So it is written for a classroom setting, but I still think the tips and things at the end of each chapter still apply to homeschooling. And again, I think this was written in 2009. So it does have some, there is research dated within the book that could potentially be older, but it's still useful information. So again, here's the table of contents. Why don't students like school? How can I teach students the skills? So each chapter begins with a question, is drilling or route memorization worth it? So the first chapter really goes into, here's the question, how memory works. And I really appreciate how the author talks about this, the difference of working memory, long-term memory, how information is stirred in our brain. So it's very, it does have a lot of scientific things in, but again, that's more what I go for when I'm reading books is things with a scientific background. And it goes into the necessity of background knowledge and how important that is for a child when they're learning is that contextual knowledge. I know there's this big push for things like hands-on, and immersive experiences and how that greatly affects how your child can learn. And this does go into not so much learning styles, but let me see if I can find it here. Beneficial to understanding the di different types of cognitive learning. Because like I said, there's this big push on hands-on learning or they'll learn better if they're interested in it and how scientifically how our mind works and how we store information. That's not always the case. So I think having an understanding of how our brain works and how cognitive skills and knowledge of cognitive science can be helpful in planning what and how to teach to our students or our children and there is in each chapter, after each question is um, asked, there's implications for the classroom. So it gives you ideas of how you can apply these to your student in different ways. So I really like the scientific background of it. Emphasis on memory and how information is stored and the how to apply those things to your student or your classroom or the children you're working with. So I found this really an actual helpful resource. All right, so next I'll be talking about kids books. So the first ones I'm going to share are my 10 year old fourth grader. All the first chunk of books I'm going to show you are all by Katherine Applegate. She's an amazing author. We've read almost every one of her books and my daughter really appreciates it. She has a tendency to write from an animal's perspective, which my daughter really relates to, but she talks throughout her books about different things. So Otter is about an otter, and it's almost told in like a free verse. It's a very quick read, and this otter's um, kind of story and what happens to them. And what my daughter really likes about these Otter books, or the Catherine Applegate books, is that, she, as she puts it, she talks about real things. So she's really giving a voice to the feelings and sometimes the suffering that happens in life. And it's not always, you know, rainbows and unicorns and happy, that sometimes in life there are difficult parts and how we get through those. But it's done through the perspective of an animal, and she definitely, the author, has a conservationist um, point of view. So a lot of her books have talking about the importance of taking care of our planet, nature, how we affect different things. So this was a one we recently read, and then I'm going to go through a couple others that were really good. Endling. This is a three-part series. This is the third book, I believe. We've read the first, almost about to finish the second one. 
Now we found Catherine Applegate through Torchlight. We used Torchlight to leave that up above. We love the books suggested in Torchlight. Two of them, this one and Crenshaw, and I believe one more were suggested and they're amazing. So this is a three book series and it's about Bix and it's a mythical fantasy, but it talks about kind of ethics and morality and breaking down systems of control and abuse of power. So it has all these really intricate layers within it. And there's a series of characters that go through it. And like my daughter says, it's not always happy. They go through difficult things and they emerge out of it. And I think it's a wonderful series. And we really look forward to the third book. Even my six-year-old really enjoys this series. And it's not, like I said, always easy. There are some parts that are more difficult that um, one of the first parts of the book is this character, her entire family is killed. And she, the fear is that she is the last of her species alive. And a lot of the stories are her out going to find other of her species to really see if she's the endling. That's what's called the series endling. And each book has a different, um, is in a continuation of the story. So the books don't have um, a necessary end. It's just a continuation of the story. But there's really strong female characters. And like it's a, the other character in it. Kara is a, I believe, 12, 13 year old girl. And she's living in a time when girls aren't seen as powerful or important. So it's got a lot of great themes to it that I would highly recommend this series and the audiobooks are amazing on this. Next is Crenshaw. We read this one, I believe last year with Torchlight. But again, this is about a boy who is dealing with family difficulties. He's facing homelessness and it goes through how this, his imaginary cat Crenshaw comes to him and helps him work through these really difficult, deep emotions that he's feeling. And it's a wonderful book. And it, I think why my daughter related so well to this is it really acknowledges the feelings and thoughts of the child. A lot of the adults in the books are talking down to children or not really acknowledging their feelings. This definitely gives the perspective of a child and it's not shying away from difficult things like homelessness. This is something we've dis discussed in our social justice. Um, when we talk about social justice issues throughout the school year, and I think it paired really well, giving that perspective that we make assumptions about people in those situations and we don't really understand their story and it's not always happy. <laughs> And there are difficult things you have to go through, but it really acknowledges their emotions and feelings through that. So I appreciate that. The next is the one and only Ivan and the one and only Bob. They are releasing a new one, the one and only Ruby. So the one and only Ivan is about the gorilla. The one and only Bob is about the dog. And the next one coming out in this series, I think, I believe it comes out in May, is the one and only Ruby. So I feel like this one has been popular for a while. It's the true story of a gorilla who was kept in a mall type zoo for entertainment and his desire to be free. And it, again, it goes through the perspective of the animals. Is it difficult and sad at times? Absolutely. But it's really giving value and just value and acknowledging the feelings and talking about, you know, that moral ethical line of things like zoos and using animals for entertainment and when that when that crosses the line of being wrong. And then my daughter really liked the one and only Bob. It was Bob's story and how he came to what happened before he met Ivan and things like that. So again, it's that perspective. And then I'm assuming the one and only Ruby will be her perspective throughout the story. But my daughter liked a lot of the Torchlight books suggested we read the first one and it leads to reading the others in the series. So we started reading the first Endling book and that led to reading the others in the series. So I highly recommend anything by Catherine Applegate. We really enjoy her. So the next will just be some resources we've recently come across that I think are good. So we recently again read this in Torchlight. We were learning about Frida Kahlo 
the artist, and I think this is a great like historical fiction book to go with it. It's about a girl, Paloma, who is visiting Mexico with her mom for the summer, and she's trying to rediscover her Hispanic heritage and all that. And it goes into a lot of detail about Frida's life and the difficulties of her life, and it goes through a lot of her paintings. And while we were listening to the audiobook of this, we would bring up the paintings on the computer so the kids could look at the paintings and get a better understanding of what, um, what was going on. But I think understanding Frida Kahlo's life really helped understand her work a lot better. So I would highly re recommend this. It's a mystery book and about really exploring Frida Kahlo but also authenticity and not being fake, which I think is a great topic to be covering, especially in those preteen years. Next are just some resources that my kids have really liked. So the first would be the Show Me History series. These are graphic novels that talk about historical figures. I think the uh, Who Was book series with the big heads are really popular, but I think these are great resources because they are graphic novels. I think they're, one, easy for kids to read, but it's also very helpful for them to relate and be able to visualize some of the things. And it's a little bit more appealing to read. So again, this goes over Frida Kahlo's life, and we paired this with um, me, Frida, and the secret of the peacock ring when we were reading it. So that was really helpful. And my daughter can definitely, my oldest can read these independently. But throughout Torchlight, there are times when you can add things like this. And it does give important um, facts about it, a timeline, things in the back, how to find out more information. But I think this gives you some of the different ones you can do, Helen Keller. So I really do like the series more than the Who Was series. I just think these um, are a little bit more visually interesting and accessible to a lot of different readers. So the next would be science comics. These are really popular with my oldest. Torchlight does have, um, in the level we're doing, some suggestions of reading these along with different uh, things you're studying. So for example, when we were doing the human body, we did the digestive system when we were doing um, artificial intelligence and talking about that in Torchlight. We did the robotics one when we were talking about inventions. In science, we talked about things like cars and planes. So there's lots of different comics. Yeah, you can see here there's coral reefs, dinosaurs, volcanoes, bats, flying machines, plagues, and that's not even all of them. There's a whole different series and again I think because it's in this graphic novel format that it's just a lot more interesting and accessible to different readers but it's chock full of information so we would read this when it was in Torchlight we would read the section that was in it um, but most of the time we'd end up reading the entire thing and there are some it does get into some a lot of information at times which can go over my six-year-old's head but not my ten-year-old and again, my 10-year-old would be able to read these completely independently. But it's a great way to introduce information. This one was talking about different species and how traits are passed and different things like that. So it's just a really fun way to present that information. So the last one I'm going to show you is my six-year-old's favorite books, because a lot of these books I'm talking about really relied on my oldest one or the adult. But something we have, again, recently come across through Torchlight is these books. So these are, again, they talk about historical things that actually happen, but from a mouse's perspective. So for Torchlight, we did Edison, the uh, missing mouse treasure. And again, as you can tell by the uh, title, it's uh, really about the story of electricity and light bulb and Edison and all of that. But the graphics in here are absolutely amazing. And I think that's what drew my six-year-old to these books is that she's definitely a visual kid. And it's funny because when you finish the book, you can go back and see there's clues to the mystery of the book at the end that you don't pick up until you're done with it. So, of course, I didn't tell my 
youngest that who this was about before we read the book, but she was like, oh my God, it's about Edison at the end. <laughs> so it goes over about how this uh, mouse's grandfather influenced these events and they go on a mouse treasure hunt to find what his grandfather left in the ocean. And a lot of it, like I said, is just full page picture illustrations, which I think, especially for the younger readers, is able to keep that attention and make it more interesting. So we were talking about, of course, um, electricity and Edison and all those things. So that's why we read this. And it does have historical facts in the back, as well as a biography, and then information about the author. So the other one that we got from the library is about Armstrong. So this is, of course, about Neil Armstrong landing on the moon and all that. But again, this is from the mouse's perspective. So the mouse, mouses believe that the moon was originally a big pile of cheese. Again, the illustrations are amazing. And it's got some information in there that I think is really helpful. So a lot of like engineering solutions. So they have a problem, they try to solve it. They test those theories, see if they work. And just like before, it'll have um, like history of space in the back, the Apollo program. So actual factual information is in there as well. And then about the author, I believe there is one more in this series and it's uh, Lindenberg, I believe. But those are just really fun books to include, especially for your younger readers or pre-readers to include in your information when you're learning about these different topics or space or electricity or anything like that. Those are all the book resources uh, we have encountered this year that I would highly recommend for both for adults, educators, um, resources for kids, picture books, all of it. All of these books are really awesome and honestly we own a lot of them now but the library does have a lot of these so don't feel like you have to go out and buy them. The library definitely is a great resource to check out these books, but I look forward to seeing what everybody else is sharing and adding some books to my library wish list. But if you have any specific questions about any of the books I shared, leave them in the comments below. If not, thank you for watching.